Hey, welcome back. Yeah, sorry, we took a kind of a long hiatus for the holidays, but this is, uh, we're back with episode 62 of the Clive Barker podcast. Uh, this is 2013 in review. So this has been kind of a, a, this has been kind of a tradition that Jose and I have been uh, going over the, 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 the previous year, that the year that just ended, so that we could, uh, you know, talk about the cool things that came out and the and the cool announcements and news and stuff. So, so that's what we did. Um, it was it was me, Ryan, and and you know I'm Ryan, and then Jose, and uh, we had a special guest host, uh, Stephanie Irabaran. Um, so uh, she's a big time fan. She met Jose at one of the uh, at one of the um, screenings of the Cabal Cut of Nightbreed, um, and she was dressed as Narcisse, which was pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, anyway, this is episode 62, 2013 in, in review. Uh, you might notice a little bit of a difference in the quality, um, well, or in the recording sound. Um, we have, uh, we're having some technical issues and, uh, my voice got really low. So we've got, we're dealing with two different recordings and anyway, um, yeah, hopefully it's still, you know, it still sounds good. Welcome to episode 62 of the Clive Barker podcast. Um, I'm Ryan, and and uh, and Jose is here also. Hi, guys. And uh, today we have Stephanie Ira Baron uh, as our guest host. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Jose. Hey. Hi. Hello. It was it was nice to to talk to you again because I met uh, Stephanie in uh, Convolution Festival uh, a few months ago where we saw one of the screenings of the Cabal Cut, and uh, you came in full uh, Narcisse uh, cosplay, which was really fun, and uh, uh, there's pictures of you on Occupy Media, and so it's nice to meet you again. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it uh, was really interesting to be dressed as <laughs> Narcisse, <laughs> being kind of maybe the only one dressed <laughs> oh, as a Nightbreed character. Excuse me? Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I think so. Yeah. I think I've, I've seen somebody at every screening that I've been to. There's at least been one person. Oh you, yeah. Yeah. You, you, there's been a lot of Deckers. There's been a lot of Deckers and, all, and yeah. a lot of pinheads and different kinds <laughs> yeah. of in the realm of Clive Barker yeah. characters show up. I saw a couple Pelequins. So a very no fat pen, Pelequin in Mexico, a pretty chubby guy. <laughs> That was funny. I was like, man, sure Pelequin was... really left himself go. <laughs> I'm sure he was still cute, though. Pelequin is very oh, cute. Oh, yeah, totally, totally. Well, uh, we can start off with the news. This kind of is going to blend a little bit into what we're into our main topic because um, just, you know, because the, our main topic is a lot is our favorite releases and our favorite news from 2013. So we're kind of doing 2013 in review. Uh, but in the news, the first thing is the Books of Blood, uh, unabridged Audible, uh, unabridged Books of Blood, Volume Four, Five, and Six have shown up on Audible. So that's the entire collection now is on, on Audible. Yeah, some of them have like uh, uh, different introductions or something. And I've heard the and and I think was it Mark was saying that Clive wanted to have a different author for each of the volumes. I mean, a different right. reader, a different reader, not author. Right, right. A different reader, not author. Oh, yeah. like a different kind of um, narrator. Narrator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but now yeah. those are all there on. I do, do. Either of you subscribe to Audible? No, not yet. <laughs> no, I think I did a trial once, but I didn't go through with it. Yeah, I listen to a lot of podcasts and music while I'm driving, but I haven't really listened to a lot of books. Somehow, uh, for me, audiobooks, it's like. I need to have a book in front of me to read because if I'm just listening, it just kind of drones out. And after a while, I have to 
I have to go back and scan back on the audio book yeah. to find the spot where I was still paying attention because otherwise it's like I'm a very visual reader. So I need to, I need to look at the words and read and, you know, get into the zone where the words turn into like images in my mind. If I'm just listening to someone else say the words, it's like I have to pay attention to what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you zone out for a little bit, then, then you miss stuff. Yeah. yeah, and you have to you have to hit the back button. Not quite sure how far to go back, and and it's on an i. I don't know about on on other things, but on an iPhone, the controls for scanning backwards on on a really long um, audio file are are difficult to do. Oh yeah, on a phone screen, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. it's because it's so sensitive, and you go back. It's like you're trying to go back thirty seconds, and you just went back forty minutes. But that's great. I mean, that, you know, Audible is uh, having all these uh, audio books now. I, I wish that they would go back. And um, I was just thinking the other day, you remember when uh, The Forbidden Story was dramatized by BBC and they played it uh, uh, live on a radio show? Yeah. It was like when? last year. Oh. It was in July, I think. Um, and it was just a one time event. Yeah. And. And the BBC player lets you, like, uh, listen to it, like, for a certain number of days. Mm -hmm. But then if you miss it, uh, there's no way you can listen to it again. Because some of those episodes, it was called Friday Drama. Some of those episodes were released on CD or on iTunes. But this particular one, as, along with a bunch of other Friday dramas, they are not available for, for sale. So I'm, I'm still looking for someone out there who may have recorded it. And, you know, who may have it, you know, I'd like to listen to it again because I I didn't listen to the whole thing the first time. So calling all listeners right now, if you if you have a, a recording of that, uh, let us know. We'd really like to hear it. Yeah. And we'll we'll thank you on the podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm racking my brain as a super fan. Which what's um, which one is the forbidden? It's the story that was adapted into Candyman. Oh, yeah. Okay. And have you have you read the books of blood, Stephanie? I've read the books of blood, volume one to three, and the uh, inhuman condition, and in the flesh. Oh. And then it, the, the, then volume six is what's at the end of Cabal. Okay, and then there was um, the last illusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's part of volume six. Mm -hmm. When I read them, I read them out of order. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, in in the U.S., they make it hard because I mean you don't really know. You it's hard it's hard to tell which one's four and which one's five between the inhuman condition and and uh, and in the flesh. Yeah. At the time when I was reading those books, it was kind of wherever I could find Clive's work, and it was usually right. at a this really cool used bookstore and. Just whatever had his name on it, I would grab, not That's... knowing that there was a certain order that they should yeah. be read. Or not not really saying that there's a certain order, but kind of there's an order to them. That's the honeymoon uh, period. Yeah. 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 Period. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the next thing is Clive Barker was announced as the Noise Festival mute movie curator. Well, they said moving images curator, so... Uh, that makes him kind of a uh, a judge, right? Or he's he's deciding which things are getting entered into the festival. Right. Yeah, him with a panel of um, eleven other really cool people. Um, yeah. One of them is uh, Brian Eno. Oh really? Wow. Yep. Who's Brian um, Eno? Oh Brian, my God, Brian Ryan! <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you asked that. Brian Eno is a huge composer and musician. Uh, yeah, I mean, oh. yeah, he's he's really he's a big producer. He's uh, he you know he's he he's got a huge discography out there. You know. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, he was he was in Roxy Music. Uh, um, he was. I'm trying to come up with uh, this on the spot now. Uh, he, he was in a bunch of stuff. <laughs> He produced okay. a bunch of albums for a lot of famous people. He, you know, he did a bunch of stuff. Okay, okay, yeah, gotcha. All right. Um, uh, this one's kind of big. Um, the January cover of well, it's actually the February issue, but it'll come out sometime in here in January soon. Uh, of Fangoria is going to have a big uh, painting of Decker, and it's going to have a large. 
a big interview with a lot of the people involved in Nightbreed. Yeah, that's going to be great. I got mine reserved at the comic store already. I can't wait to have that, you know, Fangoria. Yeah, yeah. and a major interview with uh, Cronenberg. Yeah, yeah, Dave, that's the big that's the big kind of the big announcement. It's big David one. Cronenberg, but also um Clive Barker and and Bobby Doug Bradley. And I thought that Russell said that they interviewed him and Mark also. Probably. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. yeah. So cool. And it's a really neat uh it's it's a really neat kind of painting. Some people didn't like that he looked you know, he looks kind of his face looked kind of messed up, his mouth does in the painting, but I think it looks cool. I think Yeah, he was um he he kind of looked like a less um like a less um structured version of button face. It kinda of, it reminded me of the movie Watchmen and how they did Rorschach in the movie they kinda of made him really monstrous and uh. visually instead of like kind of methodical and buttoned down and I kind of I thought that when I saw the the painting he just looked a little too wild. Yeah, he yeah. looks how like, I, then how like I a monster. Him. What I thought was that it looks like the reanimated, reanimated Decker. That's what yeah. it looks like to me because he's got like bloody saliva and his mouth is all you know weird. So to me, that's like a reanimated Decker at the end, which you know, is, is I not going think... to even appear in in the extended version. Sure, yeah, I didn't that's even true. Think of that. That when I see him like that, he does he does look like like if they continued on with the the next one, he would look pretty yeah. similar. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, that scene is so hokey. But you know what? You know, bless those people out there who still think that they prefer that ending to the other one. It's like there's an ending to everyone. You know, if you like Decker and you like seeing him at the end, you like seeing like Ashbury resurrect him, that's more power to you. It's, I think it, it was really well shot. Um, yeah. It, it, and the, the the way the scene is set up is pretty cool. Um Brandy, that's her favorite part. She was kind of bummed out when she saw the cabal cut. Sure. That's um, that's my significance. My my significant other's um favorite ending was the um theatrical, the way oh, he's really? kind of like his arms are going to the camera and the camera's kind of panning back. Just the way that looks is oh, very yeah. iconic. It, it is cool. I mean, it was. It was something that the it was a reshoot that he was forced to do, but at the same time, Clive Barker still created it and directed it. Right. Maybe he wasn't super thrilled about it, but I, you know, of course, this would open up uh, a whole can of worms in case the movie had been successful, and if there had been plans for the sequel, uh, then they would have to explain a lot uh, if they couldn't get Cronenberg to come back for a sequel. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, you maybe just have the mask on all the time. Sure. Yeah. That's pro- <laughs> has no problem. Be, has he been doing any acting since then? I know he was in um, To Die For. He, oh, I just saw him. With, Jennifer and I have been watching the show Alias, and we just saw him. He he played a, a, a guest character on on Alias. Oh, really? No way. <laughs> yeah, he was Ooh. like this this hippie. Uh, he was a hippie doctor that was bringing um that was bringing her memories back after oh. she had that two-year lapse in her memory uh-huh that's cool. a doctor i guess he has that that look about him yeah <laughs> yeah uh the last thing i saw him was a short that he actually did uh where he played himself uh and it's a really weird movie it's like He's he's sitting in a bathroom and he's like uh, he's he's talking to the camera and the movie has a really long title. It's called "At the Suicide of the Last Jew in the World in the Last Cinema in the World." So huh. it, it's a really it's on YouTube. I I you know I suggest you guys go and check it out. It's really okay. kind of a monologue thing. So but weird. It's, it's so weird. Yeah. Yeah, definitely gotta check that out. Uh, well, our next thing is Clive Barker Imaginer uh, art book. So that's put together by um, is that oh, Century Guild is putting mm-hmm. that together. The Clive Barker Imaginer art book, and it's a Kickstarter. Um, I've already put in. I've already pledged my seventy five dollars to get the the hardcover nice. edition of that. Nice. Uh, nice. I'm hoping um. that I have the money when it <laughs> when it comes out. <laughs> Yeah. That um 
I was looking at um, Clive's um, former art dealer, Bert, Bert Green. Green. Yeah. Uh-huh. And yeah, it, there, on, on Bert Green's website, it says um, like an artist's um, note to his to Clive's collection, and that Clive, I guess he he had wanted the word imaginer on his uh, tombstone. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's cool. Don't confuse it with Imagineers, who are the guys from Disney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Maybe he was referring to that, too. <laughs> right. Yeah, so uh, Century Guild is the gallery that's now representing Clyde Barker, I think. And it's, mm-hmm. in, uh, it's in Washington Boulevard in the heart of the Culver City Arts District in Los Angeles. So... Um, yeah, this is going to be the, there's going to be the catalog for the um, exhibition, and there's going to be a book about the exhibition, as it's yeah. you know customary with art exhibitions. So um, they've they're kickstarting this, and we'll add the link to the show notes. And if you when you go on their Facebook page, it says art book and documentary, uh, mm-hmm. which is a kind of a teaser because they they I haven't seen anything where they've described the documentary at all, but uh, but that's something to look forward to. I think. I- future you know i um heard a few years ago that there was some students that followed clive for around for like a year doing yeah. some kind of documentary maybe maybe that's the documentary oh, wow. unless it's a well, different documentary there is a facebook page which uh, i've discussed with ryan before uh, it there's actually a facebook page that's called clive barker imaginer deluxe art book and documentary film yeah. And in it, there's there are pictures. They've been posting pictures of like backs of uh, backs of canvases that have stuff written on them. They have like uh, the whole setup they're doing in the studio. The pictures they've been taking, which are being color corrected by gallery uh, professionals. So they have posted pictures of the setup that they have. They've been recording Clive painting uh, for uh, quite some time now. So that that's all going to go uh-huh. into the documentary. Well, then they could put it in fast motion. Yeah, so you could paint paint a painting really fast. Yeah, and backwards too. <laughs> and backwards. <laughs> oh boy! Oh my God! Yeah, that reminds me of Alias. Actually, I was I, I was noticing that uh, a lot of the episodes of that show, Jennifer Garner walks into the episode in slow motion with like rock music playing. Oh yeah, she. Uh, I remember. She, there was always pictures everywhere, and she had this red hair, these big yeah. black boots, and very rock and roll. Yeah, and she'd go come in in slow motion, so I'd call it Snailius. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> That's a good pun. <laughs> okay, well, uh, the, the next one is is um, Nightbreed. Uh, or actually, no, sorry, Lord of Illusions. Um, yeah. What, you found this one out actually. One hundred and one Films, which is a UK company. Yes. Uh, let me let me get that link really quickly so I can uh, so I can tell it to you guys. So 101 Films on Facebook, they made a post the other day uh, which said, "Lord of Illusions update. We will now be releasing Lord of Illusions on 27th February 2014. This release will include the theatrical cut in high definition, the director's cut in standard definition, and the director's commentary and trailer. Our work mm-hmm. to follow soon." So um, then someone asked, there's no HD master of the director's cut? And their reply was, sadly not. Uh, MGM only had the original master for the director's cut. Uh, we were disappointed but not surprised. That's, yeah. what, they, well, that's what they wrote. I wonder um, if they meant the, the master for the theatrical cut because they, yeah. they wrote DC on it and maybe they meant to write TC. That's right. They said DC. I was I was just yeah. realizing that while I was reading it. Yeah, but of that, course, that kind of threw me too. But yeah, but I think what what they meant was they only had the master for the standard yeah. definition, for the the, the the theatrical cut, the one that has eleven minutes chopped out of the movie. Yeah, which makes sense because for quite some time the MGM HD channel has been playing Lord of Illusions and it's been playing uh, the cut version, which is the yeah. one that shows on TV. Well, and up so. until recently, the theatrical cut had just disappeared. I mean, the the version that everyone has is the director's cut. They didn't make – I think maybe there was a VHS of the theatrical cut, but only for a short time, and it was director's cut after that. Yeah, but uh, at the same time, it's like Netflix has 
the cut version. MGM yeah. HD plays the cut version. Yeah, and apparently it's now the Blu-ray, it's going to be the, the cut version is going to be in high definition, while the yeah. other one's just going to be standard, you know, 480p or whatever. Yeah, so. that, that's weird. It doesn't make sense to me because that's, I mean, that's what they made the DVD from was the the the, the director's cut. So where, where did it go? I know. I, I'm more concerned about this uh, 101 Films comment saying the MGM yeah. only had the original master for the uh, theatrical cut. Yeah, what I'm were like, they making the DVD out of? What is it with these studios that they don't save the, the the director's cut, you know? And like, but when you think about it, they haven't re-released uh, the director's cut in a long time, maybe ever, right? Was there right. only ever one release of it? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the 96 or so release. La- Laser disc and then DVD. Yeah. And yeah. in fact, is that the, how long the, it was? Yeah. It's yeah. been a while. It's been a yeah. while. And the, and in fact the 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 director's commentary he calls it a laser disc. Sure, yeah. Uh so let's hope that this means that uh, MGM is trying to save this for a special occasion, I don't know, maybe mm-hmm. some kind of anniversary. I would like to believe that, but well somehow... and that's, that could be a region 2 uh release. So even if even if, you know, some of us will want to have that Blu-ray but you know may not be able to play it. It yeah, would be true. coming on twenty years and like a year from now, right? Oh God. Yeah. Know, right? yeah I, <laughs> I remember good, going good to see that in the theater. Well, well it doesn't catch. feel like it was that long ago. Yeah, I it's rented from it, but um, I still I kept uh, newspaper clippings, like oh, wow. um, movie oh, reviews you did? before it. Yeah, I did. <laughs> oh wow! Oh, can amazing. you can you like um, take a picture of those? I um, have them back home in Wisconsin, so oh. so <laughs> so probably not. No, <laughs> okay. but next time I go visit over okay. there, I'll go I'll go dig in through see what <laughs> I can find. All right. The funny trivia is that one of the friends of the podcast, which I'm not sure if he wants me to say this, so I'm not going to say his name. But one of our friends has uh, the newspaper from the movie that has the the cover with uh, um, Demore's uh, uh, Wickoff Street, uh, the thing that that they show in the beginning of the movie where the guy goes into the office of uh, Harry Demore and he he asks him rough night and he's like yeah, yeah the worst oh, yeah. and then there's a there's a newspaper that says uh, private eye involved in something i don't know exactly what it was but one of our friends has that newspaper he bought it the prop and whoa and he says like was it was the kid really possessed and he says probably yeah yeah so uh, cool. that, that, that's a really cool piece of truth i think there. i can guess who you're gonna say yeah yeah i i won't say it now because i don't know if he wants me to you know because d- everybody it. will everybody will mob him and, and try to steal his newspaper <laughs> maybe so, he but, can uh scan it or take a picture yeah, yeah. He, uh, I think he took a picture once, but it was in an old forum, and now that forum is gone. So, oh man, that's that's too bad. Yeah. Um. So that. Uh. Oh, and then and then the actual the director's cut or the extended cut, whatever they're going to end up calling it, of Nightbreed is has been delayed. It was they, their original projection was the summer, but now they're delaying it until fall. And this doesn't bother me. I don't know about you guys, but this doesn't bother me at all. I mean, I'm I'm totally happy to let them take the time that they need to to make a nice release of it. Yeah, yeah it's just more time to if they're going to record new music or new voiceover, do whatever they need to do and make it smoother. Oh man, I'm crossing my fingers here because, you know, I hope that they do that, you know, rescore the movie and stuff like that. Oh, There's so yeah. much there's so much that they can do to the yeah. movie, so I'm, I'm just excited. Yeah. And, you know, obviously, uh, I'm not going to lie and say, well, I want it right now. But at the same time, it's like late summer, early fall. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much the same thing. So, Well, and, and, and now um, now that, that uh, Scream Factory's got it and Morgan Creek are working on it and Clive Barker, Occupy Midian's been kind of out of the loop. Um, I mean, we try to keep up with the news, you know, for everybody, but, but they're, you know, we're learning things as like at, at the rate that everybody else is now. 
Yeah, but we're still, you know, we're we're still working hard to find all the news and bring them to you. So. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I guess what I mean is that, like, you know, we had plan, we had hoped to put in special, you know, to to contribute to special features and things like that. And yeah, yeah. Gosh, yeah. I know. And, and nobody's really asking us anything, or I don't know. That's, That's okay. True. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. <laughs> no. I, I, Unless it is. Yeah, <laughs> that could be. I guess you know I'm I'm happy that uh, we managed to help out in a small way, and you know create this wonderful community of people, and uh, yeah, it's been a great experience. So now everybody's just holding their breath and you know getting, you know trying their patience a little bit, uh, waiting for the the release of the movie. I'm yeah. sure when it comes out, everybody's going to be happy and. We can move on with our lives, but at the same time, I'm sure we're going to find a bunch of stuff to discuss about yeah. the Cabal Cut or the Director's Cut, as it's going to be called. So, And the, and, the, one, the one thing that we still kind of want to be vigilant on is, is we don't know what's going on with the European release. And, you know, the three of us, it doesn't really affect us that much, but... Uh, you know that's really important to a lot of people, and it was a it was a British movie. Yeah, and I'm sure that there's as many, if not more, people in Europe who also enjoy Nightbreed. I mean, and they never got a DVD to begin with. No, that's terrible. I mean, they never really got a DVD in a lot of countries in Europe. It's yeah. like I have a version that came out in Portugal, and it was a VHS that I that I bought from my rental shop. <laughs> it's like because there wasn't even like a, a, oh, regular, a mass market. Yeah. There wasn't even a mass market release of Nightbreed in Portugal, for example. So I had to buy the tape from my uh, uh, VHS rental store. After the guy was like done with it, it was like, "Oh, you like this movie so much? You know, I can sell you the tape." I'm like, "Really?" It's like, "Yeah, yeah," but it it cost a bundle, and uh, and then DVD came out, and I was hoping for it to come out, but it never did. So. That's pretty much it. Then I got the American DVD. So well, and it was like a good six, five or six years before it came, but before it came out on DVD. Sure. I mean, was there any uh, since DVDs started? Was there any special introduction on the VHS, like special introduction by Clive Barker or anything? Yes, like there that? was. Yes, there was, and you can find that video on the Seraph Inc. Uh, YouTube channel, and mm. we can we can leave a, a, a link for that in the show notes. Okay, I'm Ooh. taking a note. Yeah, um, and it's it's on the Laserdisc, too. Introduction, video. So. Yeah, there's there's a video where he uh, he's sitting on a chair, everything is dark, and then he starts talking about uh, the night breed and the darkness and fantasy and all that stuff. And yeah. it's just a really cool video. And he ends he, with he a... Keeps looking, he, the, the camera keeps moving to different angles, and then he turns and looks at the camera and talks again. Yeah, and he's got all these busts lined up with uh, Leroy Gom, Shuna Sassy, and Cabal. I got to and, see the Leroy Gom and the Cabal busts. Uh huh. They were at his place, right? Yeah. Did he have the little circular glasses on? <laughs> uh, oh, in the in no no in the, I don't think he had glasses on at all in that video. Going back to um, European fans. I have an uh, acquaintance who is from England, mm -hmm. and um, I told him one time, oh, I, I really like Clive Barker. I read his books. I, never, I didn't name anything specific. The first thing he, told, he said to me was, oh, uh, do you know Nightbreed? That's, and, yeah, I know Nightbreed. And then he said, oh, my God, um, I didn't know, like, anybody else would know that movie. And oh, wow. It was really cool. Right. Uh, that goes to show how obscure it became in Europe as well because it just there wasn't DVDs or VHS tapes or anything. Mm -hmm. I mean even the v, the DVD that I have that's from Europe, it's an Italian one. I keep going back to this. It's an Italian DVD of the movie. It's called Cabal. And then everybody is dubbed in Italian and it's a really bad transfer. It's it's so hokey when I look at that movie. Uh it, there is no audio track for English. It's just Italian and Peliquin sounds so funny. Well, the D and the DVD, the U.S. DVD, isn't anything to to, uh, to jump up and down about either. I mean, it's right. it's got factoids about Clive Barker that are wrong. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and and they didn't put the introduction on it. I don't know. I, it's I mean it's it's nice that it's in DVD, but it's not it's not great. Right. It was a, just a bare bones thing. This one will have yeah. a commentary. This one will have. Who knows what what special features it will have? I'm just you know I'm just excited about it. Probably it's gonna have. I, I would assume scenes. deleted scenes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna have a, a oodles of stuff. Yeah. So that's exciting. Uh, that's the last news that I have uh, before we get into you know 2013 in review. Did you guys have any other news? Any other recent stuff? Mm, not really. There's going to be some art prints from Clyde Barker available uh, starting from January 13, 2014. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, through um, through Century Guild. And, of course, like Mark Miller mentioned us the other episode, that uh, the unabridged audio version of The Thief of Always is now available at Audible. Yes. Oh, um, yeah, something else just came out, too. Turn, turn Down the Lights, the, the trade paperback is out now. Oh, okay. Um, that... I, I ordered a different version of it that's going to take a couple of more months, I think. But the the trade paperback has already shipped. So if anybody already – or it's the, the trade edition. If anybody bought that one, that's that's already out there, I guess. What is the story from Clive that shows up in that uh, – Dolly. Mythology? Dolly, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's – um. I guess there's going to be two editions of Turn Down the Lights, and one of them is going to actually have a, a drawing of the dolly. Huh. Uh, I think that must be the one that I got. I sent an email to them because I couldn't remember which version I bought, and I wanted to get an idea of when they were going to come. And she said, "You, uh, let's see if I can find it, actually. Uh, now you're making me jealous because uh, I haven't ordered it yet, so I, I need oh. to get on that. I need to get on that. Yeah. And also the Kickstarter, yeah. That's another one of those ones that went to uh, that went to the Occupy Midian email instead of the my regular Gmail. Here we go. She said, "Hi Ryan, you ordered the artist edition, which is due to ship this month or next. The trade came out all at the end of this year. Uh, that was back. Um, I think she meant at the end of 2013. Mm -hmm. But the artist edition wasn't due until the first part of this year." So, yeah, the art edition should be coming out soon, and the trade one people should already have. Um, so if anybody has that, you know, let us know. So that's cool. Cool. Supposedly the story is really short, too. Oh, oh okay. And um, Clive wants to, I guess he has a lot of really short stories, and he wants to put them together in its own volume. That would be that would be awesome. Yeah, I, I mean that, that was going to be uh, that was going to be black as the devil's rainbow. Yeah, yeah, that that used to be the Scarlet Gospels. Then it became Tales of a Journeyman. Then it became Black as the Devil's Rainbow. Tales of a Journeyman. Now that book's going to be a poetry uh, poetry book anthology. Yeah. So I know that Clive has a bunch of stories that I keep hearing about here and there. <laughs> Like, he once wrote a story about the internet. He wrote a story about, you know, Christ at the cross, and it's mm -hmm. going to be called, uh, what was it called? Uh, uh, Gosh. I forgot. Jeez. But it was going to be a story that would tell the story of Christ in a different way, and uh, there was, it was going to be told by the point of view of a dog at the Golgotha. Mm. Uh, the crucifixion. I don't even know. It's, there's so many weird rumors that we listen to, yeah. and uh, we always wonder. You know, I well, wish a I could lot just... of them are, are from interviews with Phil and Sarah. He, he yeah. reveals a lot of stuff in those, but it's always things that he's working on, and then he gets sidetracked into something else, and then those. I know. I wish I could out. ransack his files. Just go in his house one day and just like, <laughs> like Mission Impossible style, just come out of there with a bunch of boxes and take him to my house and read all that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. I want to read that stuff. Yeah, if Ryan, you... did you have a chance to ransack one of his manuscripts? I did. Yeah, I ransacked all kinds of stuff, but mm -hmm. I was so overwhelmed and I was so overwhelmed and and like in awe that I can't I couldn't remember anything that I was looking at. It's called I couldn't process memories. it. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like I it was kind of like, "Oh my god, I can't believe I'm getting to look at this. I shouldn't be looking at this." And my head was so full of that stuff that I wasn't really I wasn't really processing this. Like I, I went through Black is the Devil's Rainbow, and I paged through it and and looked through the stories and stuff. 
And I saw Heaven's Reply on the shelf too, but I didn't know what I didn't realize at the time that's an early name for the Scarlet Gospels. So I could have grabbed that one too. Wow. That's really cool. That is cool. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 you know, if I lived there, I would be going back again. But because I think so, on a, I think on a second trip, I would be a little smarter. <laughs> as in, as in, grab something and run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I visited, there, I visited there too. Um, oh, you did back in twenty ten. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, um, got Beat in touch by with a year. Yeah, <laughs> got in touch with um, his former art dealer, and he let me look around the house and take pictures. Oh, you must have been there with Brandy then, because she, she, I think she did the same thing. Um, I was there, and there was one other person there, and it was um, a young man, and I, he was, I, he either was going to or about to buy um, this giant, huge painting of Clive's that kind of... I can't remember what the name of it is off the top of my head, but it kind of looks like um, a horse. But then when you look closely, it it's actually like little pictures, and it looks like uh, like the side of a horse or some kind of is that a black like and white? Oh. Is that a black, black and white? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. Okay. Well, cool. It's kind of weird to see somebody. So you, so you didn't go in? It. Did you go in the studio house or Clive's actual house? Um, I went into the studio house. The one on the left. Yeah, there's. Yeah. It's like a like a. It kind of looks like what I imagine the house in Cold Hard Canyon yeah. would look like. A yeah. lot of. So it had the, the Nix and the Seraphim gate thing? Yeah, when you first um, go through the door, there's a, a hallway with posters and, yeah, and props yeah, yeah. and really cool things like that. And then you kind of see, like, a little kitchen to the left and yeah. to the right, um, a living room. And it's the layout of it is really bizarre because it has, like, these stairs that go down. It just yeah. seems like room after room. And yeah. Really yeah, cool really place. cool. Are, are the doors like arched? Because that's something that yes. really messes with my mind. I, I guess arched, I, and I think with bars. I think maybe this uh, little window, yeah. like medieval-looking window. Yeah, they're these the huge, on. heavy, solid, uh, solid core doors too. Because I, I don't like arched doors. I, for some reason, they freak me out. I'm like, <laughs> it shouldn't, it shouldn't be round at the top. It should be flat. I, I don't so, know. Do, I just do the Hobbit doors freak you yeah, out? Yeah, the Hobbit doors. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So, um, so when I was in in the house, I went to the area downstairs where Clive does the paintings, and he had taken these black curtains and put them over the windows. So oh, we yeah. Could yeah. See, actually, I went with Brad. It was for our ten year anniversary. It was kind of like a surprise for him. I'm like, oh yeah, by the way, when we were in, we went wow. to Disneyland. I'm like, oh by the way, we're gonna go to Clive Barker's house tomorrow. <laughs> oh my god! And uh, <laughs> that was pretty cool. And, um, yeah, but, um, though the, I did something really weird when I was there. Um, so in, in the actual area, area where he paints, mm-hmm. there's, there was like this wall and it, there's all these CDs and, and yeah, I know music what you're talking and about. trinkets yeah. and things like With that. With that circular painting up above them. And I, yeah. And I yeah. thought, um, you, you know, this is really weird and I feel, I'm going to take a picture of this, but I'm not going to show anybody. And I just took, took all these pictures of the music that he listens to. Oh, cool. Yeah, and I asked, you know, is it okay if I take these pictures? And Bert said, oh, you know, it, it's cool. Just, you know, I don't want, don't, you know, post them all up online. And yeah, that was the same thing they told me. I took pictures of everything. Yeah, I just showed, like, my mom and my dad. And I think that's about it. I put some up online, but, like, if Alex took it, if, like, say if Alex posted a picture of something, I'm like, okay, here's my version of that. Since he already did it, I, I think it's probably okay. But I haven't, yeah, I haven't been posting too much of them online. Yeah. Yeah. So when, so when you were there, uh, it would have been Rob Humphreys and Mark Miller, right? Um... When I was there, there was this, um, I can't remember his name, but this really tall guy with yeah. long hair. Yeah, that's Rob. That's Rob? Yeah, he's not there anymore, but. Rob Humphreys? Yeah. He was the angel or demon in Lord of Illusions, the guy with the butcher knife wings. Yeah. 
Oh, That's what? A little known fact. <laughs> yep. I would have known that. <laughs> yeah. But I do have his business card. Oh, okay. He says, taste the darkness <laughs> to more. Yeah, that's what he says. He, uh, there's a flashback scene, a dream sequence, and then you see this uh, this guy. I think that's only in the director's cut. Probably, probably. Yeah, I think that's, that really, that's going to be a big letdown when we realize all the stuff that's been cut out again. That yeah. was a really good, quick little scene. Yeah. Yeah, that was amazing. With a kid, the kid also like switches places with the demon in the during the flickering of the light, and it's like. Taste the darkness, the more yeah. it's coming for you, or something like that. Kind of yeah. reminded me of um, Constantine, the movie, but before Constantine. Right. Like that feeling. Right. Mm. I, I yeah, saw that uh, a long time ago. I think Neil Gaiman may have, I, I don't want to say something that's wrong, but uh, of course, Constantine showed up for the first time in the Swamp Thing comic books. And. Uh, I think that was written by Alan Moore, and he wanted, like, a detective that was, like, involved in supernatural stuff. And I wouldn't be surprised if that was kind of inspired by, you know, Harry Demore. Harry Demore. Some way. But I don't want to say that because Alan Moore is a big uh, big deal, and he also has a lot of, like, great ideas. So, But uh, it, I think it's really it's really difficult to think about the concept of a supernatural detective that doesn't involve talking about Constantine – Harry the Moore and Dylan Dog, you know. But I, uh, I don't mean to alarm you, but Alan Moore's on his way to your house right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that would be fine by me. I got a few things he could sign right there on the show. And uh, David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson are just rolling their eyes. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, what's really weird about Constantine is that Keanu Reeves would be the last person on my mind to cast as Constantine. Oh. Yeah. He he actually looks more like Sting in the comic book, but you know, oh. uh, yeah, Sting wasn't a super great actor though. Uh, no, no. <laughs> well, uh, is in t so 2013 in review. Um, the first thing I wanted to go through was releases. There haven't been a huge amount of them, um, but there's the things on Audible. Uh, this one was kind of cool. Um, the abridged version of The Hellbound Heart, which is read by Clive Barker, mm -hmm. uh, used to only be available on audio cassette. Now you can get that on Audible. Oh, great, great. Because I'm going to be honest and confess that I didn't have the cassette tapes. All I had were the MP3 files. Oh, I, I made mine into an iTunes audio book. Uh-huh. Uh, just, you know, they, by running it into the computer and, and recording it that way. I think the way that Clyde Barker uh, voices the Cenobites is really amazing. They are yeah. completely expressionless, almost robotic voices. Yeah. Yeah. Have you um, – so, Stephanie, have you heard the, the, the Clive Barker version of – the narrated version of The Hellbound Heart? No, I have not. I've actually have not heard any of his narrations. That's the only that's the only one you can buy. I mean, I think all everything else is read by other people. Yeah, and and there was a little snippet that was posted on uh, the Islands of the Aberat website, which doesn't exist anymore, where he would read the first chapter of uh, Aberat Two. Uh, I remember that. And I, and I went to a Thief of Always book signing where he in in there was a little theater in the Pike Place Market where he read the first chapter of The Thief of Always to us, which was really awesome. Nice. But I guess at the I time see. he was already probably sounding a little rough, right? No, no, not at all. Uh-uh. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was that would have been like 91 or 92, I think. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I thought you mentioned uh, first chapter of Aberat. No, so Thief of Always. Thief of Always. Okay, right, yeah. right. Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, he had his normal, I mean, he's, you know, the voice that we're used to hearing from, you know, old interviews and stuff. Yeah. yeah, his well, voice didn't change too much to my ear. Um, oh, I'd love to hear him reading Hellbound Heart. Another uh, two major things also happened in January 2013. One of them was, uh, and people are going to say, well, he's saying it wrong. New Genesis was announced as a 12-part comic series. Yeah. And at the time, it was still called New Genesis. And then it became Next Testament because yeah. DC Comics in their, uh, you know, they have the, uh, the the old Jack Kirby uh, characters uh, 
that lived in New Genesis, which was that planet. It was what was that name? New Gods or Young Gods oh, or I whatever. I thought Jack it was. Kirby was Marvel. Uh, no, he worked for both. Oh, okay. But there was the the I think it was the New Gods uh, thing where there's Dark Side lives in Apocalypse, and there oh. are the Young Gods who live in New Genesis. Oh. So because New Genesis belonged to uh, DC. I think Mark Miller and Clyde Barker decided that they were going to rename it from New Genesis to Next Testament, which also, uh, you know, works. You know, it works. Yeah. So that there have been six issues of of Next Testament so far uh, on its twelve issue run. Uh, so we're about halfway through it right now. That's true. I managed and, uh, to grab one of them from oh, the <laughs> from one oh. of the Cabal Cut um, screenings. Oh. And signed by Mark Miller himself. Which oh, one did you get? Oh, just some random number. I haven't, oh, okay. haven't opened it up yet. Well, what? Because uh, I kind of want to read that? the first ones. Um, this was at the screening in um, the Egyptian theater oh. in Hollywood. Back okay, in gotcha. Yeah, October. Mm-hmm. So, so Mark had a table there then. Actually, I kind of stuck around after the show, and he was just um, talking with fans, and I just kind of walked up to him and started chatting with them. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I, um, so next testament, it'll be really interesting to see how that story turns out. We won't spoil any of it for you. Right. Uh, you, I remember you sent me uh, one or two signed uh, copies yeah. of uh, Next Testament. Unfortunately, at the time, Hurricane Sandy? What, was it Hurricane Sandy that hit New York? And the oh, yeah. Areas? And uh, the package you sent me was like five months late for some oh, reason. That was, yeah, was, that was when you were in Portugal. Yeah, and it was all busted up. It seemed like someone mm-hmm. had played like a soccer match with the package. And oh, I guess. Man. I guess it hit the the post office. Or no, the, really those hard. were I think those were Hellraiser issues, right? That were signed yeah. by Mark. Uh, yeah, I think you sent me in that. Uh, oh, right, right. They were Hellraiser issues, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they, they were from the Mark Miller period. Okay. Yeah. Another so, yeah, thing that, that that's the other comic is that Hellraiser: The Dark Watch. Uh, even though it's a continuation of the other of the other Hellraiser series that got started last year or the year before. Uh, but the Dark Watch started in 2013. Right. And January 2013 was also a month where Clyde Barker received the Bram Stoker Award for Lifetime Achievement. And this award was received by Mark Miller at the time because, mm. uh, you know, Clyde Barker was still uh, still recovering uh, at, his ho- at his home. So Mark Miller took the award at his name. And, uh, yeah, so that was great. Bram yeah. Stoker Award, not his first and hopefully not his last. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. awesome. Um, I think they award it to those who have been in the profession for 30 years, mm-hmm. and they have to be at least 60 years old. So well, I think finally, he's like exactly 60 years old. Finally getting this really cool credit. Yeah. Right, right, because Clyde Barker was born in 52, uh, I think. Yeah. So right. we've kind of moved on into announcement and news, announcements and news, and we went through the the releases already. There really haven't been that many releases, uh, but there's been a lot of exciting news. So I think that you know, and news and announcements. So I think that means we're going to see a really good year next year. Yeah, uh, and actually, I need to make a correction because those two things that I just said, they happened not in January; they were already in February. I'm sorry about oh, that. Okay. Yeah. No. No yeah. problem. Uh, and then the next one we have on our list is is uh, Clive confirmed on Facebook that Oliver Parker would be d- directing the Thief of Always live action film. So right. Oliver Parker is Peliquin. and the Moving Man in Hellraiser. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The guy who says she's got her mother's looks. Her mother's dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean that that's awesome and. We really, really hope that that comes through this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it, it's not the first time that someone tried to adapt The Thief of Always, but I, I'm putting my money on, you know, Oliver Parker for this because uh, he, he's a he's a well-respected director, and he's got some a lot of awards in his belt. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and uh, if it's live action, then maybe it, it – 
will get done sometime in 2014. Yeah. Let's, let's hope, hope this one's the one. Yeah. yeah. Well, the man, that would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, he had also announced David Barron's involvement in the Aberat movies. So, I mean, this was, we had all kind of given, just like Thief of Always, we'd all kind of given up on the idea of an, of Aberat movies, you know, because it, it, had, it had almost been put together a few times and then fallen apart. Uh, but it seems like there's still there's there's still an ongoing hope for for those. Well, I'm I'm on the fence regarding Aberat movies because Aberat's already such a visual package, yeah. such a visual story that I almost fail to see the point uh, of of making a movie out of it. But uh, I understand that uh, it is a pretty cool idea. Yeah, but I'll take it. I, I'd love to see sure. that. Yeah, I just oh, think that. Thing. Clyde Barker's style is so amazing, and it's already pretty visual. It's like the complete thing yeah. there. You got the words, you got the visuals, and you know. I wonder if they'll mimic his style of painting. In, it, um... Some of the things would be hard to see alive, mm-hmm. you know, like um, like the um, the the brothers, uh, John John Moot and John Mischief. John Mischief. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well. We we saw when they did that uh, trailer for uh, Aberat Three, um, yeah. they they animated a little bit the beautiful moment painting. Yeah, it was animated paintings. But it was done in the style of like uh, uh, what do they call that nowadays? Those uh, uh, animated comic books. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Motion they, comics. Motion comic books where yeah. they like grab the artwork and then they just do something in flash and animate it, the words in the mouth and stuff. Uh, it, it's a little weird, but you know, it, it, I hope that if, if they do an animation, that it's going to be, uh, if they use Clive Barker's style, I'm sure they'll find a way to make it work. Boy, that would, yeah, that would be something though. That would be really interesting. There'd be nothing like that. Uh, mm-hmm. that... It'll give us a lot to talk about. Yeah. What, what, what was, how it's done and yeah. how it differs from what you envisioned and what was left out. And it's... and we still have two more books to go, so we don't know how the series is going to end. Just don't let Seth MacFarlane adapt Aberat. <laughs> oh, that's horrifying. Yeah. You don't want to hear uh, John Mischief say, you think that's bad? Remember the time I was drunk and puked on the Sea of Isabella and then cut to, uh, you know, whatever. Um, I'm sorry, guys. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) March of 2013, we covered uh, the sex, death, and starshine that showed up in the Mammoth Book of Zombies. Uh, Mm -hmm. The U.S. paperback edition of Absolute Midnight came out. Oh, and uh, Lost Souls showed up in the Mammoth Angels and Demons anthology. Yeah. And I yeah, think so that, those, was also, those are all nice. that was also around the time where the Books of Blood started coming out on Kindle editions. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and those are all nice. Of course, you want more people to get introduced to Clive Barker's stories. Uh, yeah. And then also going back to... Um, Going back to movie news, the the uh, the New Machine Studios, which was a Canadian uh, animation company, is optioned the Adventures of Mr. Maximilian Bacchus and his Traveling Circus. So at some point in the future, we may see an animated version of that book. And we talked about that quite a bit on our last, on our Maximilian Bacchus episode a couple episodes back. Yeah, yeah, we did. I mean, uh, I think I think what I said then was that uh, I think that would be great as a way to uh, extend the story a little bit and maybe have other adventures. Yeah, uh, that would open the door to create maybe a series because the actual story of Maximilian Bacchus and his traveling circus is actually pretty short. So, yeah. you know, if they can make it work, uh, why not try to make it into a series? That would be great. Yeah, and they could they could do shorts for each of the chapters, and then just kind of go on and make their own. That would be really that would be really cool. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, it's like um, a surrealistic sort of cartoon thing. Yeah. Um, Subterranean Press announced that there is going to be a Tortured Souls book. 
soon after the Chiliad and Meditation book. So Chiliad and Meditation uh, are the two bookend stories from uh, Revelations. Uh, so they 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 open and close the Revelations book. Uh, they're two Clive Barker stories, so they're going to be published in their own volume by uh, by Subterranean Press. And then they say soon after Tortured Souls will be coming out. And, That's cool. And they say Tortured Souls will be fully illustrated as well as an added bonus. I wonder if this is because the uh, idea of making a anthology of short stories kind of fell along the way. So. Yeah. These these stories started to come out in standalone editions, which, you know, it's it's cool. I mean, it's fine because uh that gives a chance for the package to be more, you know, have more introduce more variety into things like uh you'll have like little stories with as hard covers with cool art and stuff, limited editions. That 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 sounds like a good idea. Well, and also you have to wonder how many stories can they really put into an anthology? Because if you've got the two Chiliad stories, that's a good like sixty pages there by itself. Mm-hmm. So I, I mean, I, I imagine there's a lot of stuff that they could put in 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 those anthologies in that yeah. anthology, like the the former, you know, Black is the Devil's Rainbow. Well, Chiliad's going to come to my doorstep any day now, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I ordered it too, and it's supposed to be in January. Yeah. They don't. They didn't say, you know, I guess that's the deal with books, is they don't tell you an exact date that they're shipping, it's just they tell you the month. Right. In April 2013, uh, Clive's web store opened up to the public, realcliveparker.com yeah. as well. So that's a place where you can find a lot of, like, Clive Barker books, a lot of, you know, jewelry uh, stuff that he designed, and uh, if you're willing to pay a little extra, he'll sign it for you. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty cool, and it's kind of uh, there. There was one story, and I can't remember where this uh, who who reported this, but they said it was like Clive Barker's garage sale online. <laughs> in a way, <laughs> that's not far from the truth. Yeah, and if you've been in his library, I mean, the, he's got like six copies of everything in every language that he's ever produced, mm-hmm. or even is related to his work. I wonder where, if they're all really coming from his. I think I, they. I, I think so. Yeah, I I bought um, the skull bronze medallion. Oh, cool! And then I I got something in the mail the other day, and it said it was from some random state like Colorado and I opened it up and it was the bronze medallion. Oh, cool. Nice. nice. Well, well, yeah, I the, think the it's a, that's also... a third party artist that makes those. Right? Yeah. And right, right. the store also has links to Amazon. So, uh, sometimes, uh, like a, some of the items there, like at one point they had the little, uh, screaming, uh, mystery box, which is the element configuration done in plastic. Uh, there were links to an Amazon store that's, uh, of course, uh, affiliated with Clyde Barker. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, let's see. What else happened? Uh, Century Guild, we talked about that quite a bit already. Uh, the announcement uh, that Shout Factory was picking up um, was picking up the Cabal Cut, which or was picking up the extended edition of, of Nightbreed. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was kind of a huge victory for Occupy Midian. Everybody, we were, everybody was celebrating. It was awesome. Uh, there was, there was the looming question. Did they ever find the, the negatives? And, and no, they didn't. Uh, so no. that's, it's going to be, it's going to be restored from work print and, yeah. uh, and the, and the material from the theatrical cut. Right. In, uh, in in May, you mentioned the Oliver Parker confirmation as director of the Thief feature, uh, also David Barron's involvement with the Abrad movie project. In June, uh, we had that Odyssey 2 Deviant Art collaborative fiction project. Yeah. Which uh, was pretty interesting. I mean, the final product was actually a very entertaining story. There was a lot of great art there. It was set up by uh, Clyde Barker's... Uh, social media content creator at the time, Alex, uh, who managed his DeviantArt page. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty cool. I, did, did Alex set that up? Yeah, I think it was him, right? No, I didn't. Yeah, I thought it was a guy from DeviantArt. 
Oh, well, yeah. The Odyssey 1 was created by another person from DeviantArt, but I think that Alex helped it happen, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and Clive, of course, wrote the first chapter, and then everybody uh, added to it. Exactly. And that's also June of 2013 is when the Jonas Cease and Del Howison uh, opened up submissions for a new Nightbreed-related anthology. Yeah. Which was called uh, uh, Midian, Midian Unmade. Midian Unmade. Unmade, which yeah. I've been rejected from. <laughs> Me too. And you so, too. So, so, Stephanie, did you did you put a story into that? I <laughs> no, I did not. But if I, oh. I I got in late in the game on that one. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, there was also like a uh, uh, the Friday drama on BBC Radio Four that I mentioned for the Forbidden. That was also in June of 2013. And then there were a bunch of, like, Nightbreed Cabal Cut screenings all around the world, like Mexico. And, yeah. Uh, so, so, Stephanie, you've been to two, two screenings? I have been to two screenings. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the Egyptian and, and then the Berlin game? And the Berlin game, yep. Um, vastly different uh, audience size, but... Um, Still, each one very memorable. True, true. Um, the the Burlingame one was, we must have been like I don't know, maybe fifty people or something like that. Uh, wow, so, really? Is that it? Well, yeah. It was it was a it was a small kind of like tent um, put outside the hotel uh, with the, the Hyatt uh, mm-hmm. near the airport. Hyatt Regency. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it it made it very intimate. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and we, but there was uh, Russell was there, and Bobby was there. There was also another cast member who uh, Kimmy mentioned. He was in one of the scenes where he is wearing a cage in his head. He's like one of the background breed. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he was also in another scene. He's the guy. Well, he's in the flashback scene where they show uh, the Inquisition and people being thrown in a fiery pit and someone's getting something hammered into their heads and he's got a cage around his head and he's sitting in a chair. So I think that was the guy. Uh, And he's also one of the guys who looks up when the Sons of the Free explode the, um, their trip mines uh, who are installed all over the cemetery And, and things started crumbling down. And one of the guys looks up and it's like him. So he was there. That's pretty cool. I don't remember his name. I think it was John. Awesome. Well, I yeah. I, I went to um, I went to the first one in in of course in at Mad Monster Party in Charlotte, North Carolina, and then I went to one in um, New Jersey uh, because they had the Hellraiser reunion there, mm-hmm. and then the Portland one. Yeah, I almost went to that one. Yes, but, that was but, part of the reason that I went is because you were going to go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> have you guys m- met each other in person before? Yes. You he have? was at my wedding. Yeah. <laughs> he was practically my best man. Uh, that was that was fun. We met. Yeah, in yeah, that was awesome. Time. Yeah, yeah. Um, in July, that was also the month where. Um, Finally, they uh, announced that uh, Scream Factory was going to release Nightbreed. Uh, where they did that panel with Mark Miller, and there was this cryptic Facebook message from Clyde Barker where they said, uh, "In about an hour, I'm going to, you know, say make an announcement about, you know, Nightbreed. It's going to be really cool." Well, he didn't say it was about Nightbreed, but we kind of figured it was. Well, and uh, then Mark Miller, Mark Miller did a Twitter thing saying that for some reason I'm supposed to go to the Shout Factory panel. Well, he said he was going to a panel, right? He did. Did he say Shout Factory? Yeah, yeah, he did. So oh, okay, so, right. I mean, so he gave it away. We, yeah, we didn't announce that to everybody because we didn't want to give stuff away, be the people to give stuff away. But if you put those two things together, you kind of knew what was happening. Right. I, I thought at the time he said he had to be in a panel, but uh, yeah, we we pretty much, you know, we were like, huh, I don't want to uh, scream out anything, but I think I'm not a gossip factory, but uh, I, yeah, I was doing like crazy like, yeah, stuff. Yeah, right, we Twitter don't want to shout the, yeah. Yeah, but then it was, that was cool. That's when they finally decided that, you know, hey, they, they came out and said, we're going to release it. 
there's a deal that was put in place. We just closed the deal like yeah. hour, an hour before, you know, the announcement. They were like, okay, well, let's do it. So that was great. That was when all the fans were like, oh, my God, that's amazing. We finally did yeah. it. That was the culmination of a lot of, like, effort from Occupy Midian and Russell Charrington, Jimmy Johnson, everybody, you know, Mark and, Miller. And, and a lot of people, I think, at that point were expecting the movie to come out really soon. Yeah. So and it's like, like, no, no, they, they, they just announced that they're starting it. Right. <laughs> yeah. They're, they announced that the deal is in place. Now they have yeah. to work on it. They have to yeah. clean it up. They have to, like, set a date. A lot of people were like... Oh, so when is it coming out? Is it coming out like next month or something? Are they going to put it online? Yeah, they put it on iTunes. The, they didn't even get the videotapes from Mark until a couple of months after that. Right, right. So that was great. So July, that was, you know, uh, one year and a few months since Occupy Midian had started, I think. Right, right. Yeah, so it looks like Occupy Midian is going to be around for a little while longer because it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be the fall of 2014 when the when the movie comes out, which is yeah. nice. I mean, that's in time for Halloween. Yeah, and uh, at this time, I think there was also the announcement that Fiddle Black was going to release uh, Cabal and other annotations, right? Well, not only. I mean, it was it was an announcement that it's like here it is. You can pre, you can buy it right now. Right. So that wasn't even like a pre-announcement. I guess there was a pre-announcement like a year earlier. Like, and we're people thinking had... about doing this edition. That's what they. Yeah, did. and then we had we'd all kind of forgotten about it, or at least I had. And then all of a sudden it came back, and it's like, okay, this is ready. You can buy it. You can order it now. Yeah. There, yeah. There's yeah. only three hundred of them. That was cool. Uh, also, we started this conversation talking about Lord of Illusions and. Scott Bakula and Harry Damore. In August of 2013, uh, Lost Souls was reprinted in Nightmare, Nightmare Magazine, and they put mm. it back online. Because uh, at the time, I think the only place where you could read Lost Souls was at the old ClydeBarker.com website. It's still there, I think. Okay, yeah, well, it's still there. It's Not not many people go there, I guess, uh, anymore. Uh, because the webmaster, I've been talking to him on email now. Oh really? Cool. Yeah, yeah. He 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 might join us sometime. Oh, that'd be nice. Uh, so Lost Souls was put back online, well, it, for a wider audience. Um, yeah. And that was cool because I guess a lot of people out there had never read Lost Souls. Stephanie, have you have you read Lost Souls? I have not heard. I had not heard of Lost Souls until the very first time I had ever seen anything to Jose on Facebook. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's it's um and it's printed in so it's printed in what was the name of that book that you just mentioned? A Nightmare Magazine? Oh yeah, yeah. And well and it's also in in the, it's also printed in an anthology called Dark Terrors 2. So oh. if you're if you're looking in a used bookstore, look for Dark Terrors 2 and it's in there too. Oh cool. Okay. Is that like uh years ago? Yeah, it's I think it's from the 90s. Oh, cool. And I didn't know it had ever been put on print, so that's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it, it's a really cool story. I think it establishes all the main details of Harry Damore, even more so than the, the, the short story from the Books of Blood. I think I got uh, that. I found it right here. I think I Copyright got that wrong. <gasps> yeah, I got that wrong. I think it's in Cutting Edge, not uh. Dark Terrors 2. I think Dark Terrors 2 is, is like coming to grief or Pigeon and Teresa. Oh, okay. So it's a really cool story. I mean, yeah. there's Chet Chet, the demon. There's uh, Norma, the blind psychic who yeah. lives in a in a room full of TVs and stuff. And so, there's the can cankerist. Yeah, the cankerist. Uh, they introduce a lot of cool cool ideas there. I, I really love to see this expanded into a movie or something. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Um. Let's see, Clive Barker announced that he wanted to make a Wii World miniseries in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. uh, so this at the Liverpool Echo, they had talked about uh, there was a, a film festival that Clive Barker was going to be a part of. And during the interview with Liverpool Echo, he had said that he would love to to do this miniseries of Wii World in, in Liverpool. Or um, he was hoping that it would still happen, I think. It was. It seemed kind of hopeful and, and interesting. I mean, at the, mm. at, 
At the time yeah. of the announcement, it seemed like a big deal. I hope that it happens. When when you reread that announcement, it seems more like kind of a wishful thinking thing. I don't yeah, know. Maybe that's, that's true. That's kind of what I got out of it, more like a wishful thinking. Yeah. I mean, Showtime, I think, does Showtime still own the rights to that? I don't know. That's a good that, that, That's, a that's good who point. was going to do it originally. I just remember that uh, it said something like Barker revealed that he would like to base some of the filming in Liverpool should the project get the final green light. And he yeah. said, I love my home city. It shaped me body and soul. If the production of Weave World as a miniseries goes forward, I will do all in my power to shoot the exteriors in Liverpool. So Yeah, so if it goes forward, I mean, that kind of that kind of implies that, that there's something going on with it. I don't yeah. know. Mm. Well, let's hope for the best. Yeah. Uh, then, of course, there was the announcement of Dolly being in Cemetery Dance, and and it actually came out, I, I guess, um, in the trade version. Um, we don't have that yet, so we can't really comment on the story, but uh, but that's that's a previously unpublished Clive Barker short story, so yeah. I love collecting those, so it's hopefully going to be on its way here soon. Another big reveal in September of 2013 was that Clyde Barker announced that the Scarlet Gospels were finished. He said, yeah. I, might, I thought you might like to know that the Scarlet Gospels, a large novel which sets Harry Damour against the Hell Priest Pinhead, <clears throat> is finished and has been delivered to my agent. I don't have yet a publication date for it, but as soon as I do, you'll be the first to know. I won't and... say anything. Huh? What? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and now we do know the publication date and yes. the publisher. Yes, we have a publication time frame. Yeah, uh, to, it, it was winter of 2015. Right, from St. Martin's Press. Yeah. Because Clyde Barker set up kind of a an auction thing, like a, a proposal submission. Like uh, He was like, well, uh, anybody interested in publishing the Scarlet Gospels, I'm opening yeah. up uh, submissions for – proposals from publishing companies who wants to publish the Scarlet Gospels because apparently uh, Harper Collins is not interested in uh, adult horror or horror fiction from Clyde Barker anymore. So they're, they, they're just uh, interested now in Aberat. Yeah. Which, you know, hey, it's their loss, but uh, St. Martin's Press will release the Scarlet Gospels on the winter of 2015. Yep. Yeah, and then uh, Chris Angel's death premonition <laughs> trick that he did on TV. Yes, I still I, I, I still that. didn't even watch that. I somebody posted the link to the the YouTube video of it, but I didn't watch yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I they, watched. I watched it. They I turned it, it into and, and the reactions. Yeah. So, so what did you think of it, Stephanie? Um. It, um. It had me in, <laughs> it it had me held in some amount of suspense watching it, but um I um it was a really grainy video that I watched. It wasn't the best quality. Mm. And um I I just found myself making a lot of comparisons with um the movie Lord of Illusions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um I want to say, but I don't want to say that after I watched the video, I kind of really enjoyed watching what other people had to say about it. <laughs> That's a very noncommittal response. Yeah. I, I, I think he turned it Seeing, a little bit into a mentalist uh, trick, and I expected something different and a little more more edgy and more having more to do with the actual illusion from Lord of Illusions. Because what, what I saw was just ropes and numbers and the oh yeah this is going to fall now and then that one's going to fall and i was a little disappointed i thought it was going to be different i actually I think it would have been better live than yeah because than live it, it was a complete mess uh there was a blog post that i uh, i told ryan about some guy who uh, was actually in the audience and he said it took them like three hours to record that thing and then they just chopped it up edited it together and that's the trick but that people oh. were, yeah, isn't that, that was, fake? That's kind of fake magic, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I know it's magic. all fake, but it's like that's using using, uh, you know, using special effects and stuff. 
Yeah, yeah, but, that was you know, kind and camera, of camera camera angles. Sure, but that that's how they did it. Apparently, there there was uh, like there was at one point a malfunction in the ropes and stuff, and they had to stop the recording. That they had to go back, and they had to do a whole security stunt thing again. And then they 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 were rolling again, and then one of the ropes didn't come off. And uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, that just goes to show you that don't trust oh. anything you see on TV. It's all edited. So. Yeah. I, I was expecting something a little different. Uh, How would you like to have been there in the audience if it really took three hours to do that? You, you would have been bored because the guy oh. was like, there were people that were trying to leave, and they were in this like little squared off section with like bars around them, and the guys <laughs> from the production were like, no, you got to be in there for a bit, you know, yeah. we're still not done. And people were like, I want, I just want to go, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think somebody was saying in the reaction videos, oh, if you make a lot of hoopla as a reaction, you're, you'll probably get on TV, even though you're just kind of faking it. Yeah. Oh, so, hey, you know, that's, you know, David Copperfield never really go through the Wall of China. He didn't really levitate over the Grand Canyon. So I'm not surprised that magic for TV as, you know, camera tricks. Yeah. Uh, that said, it was still it was still good to see Lord of Illusions being referenced uh, in a Chris Angel trick. That, that's yes. what we can yes. take away from yes. that. Yeah. And Clyde Barker introduced the trick on TV. He had a little video shot in his house saying, "You know, Chris Angel is our Lord of Illusions." Blah blah blah. Yeah. Which yeah, okay, it's fine. It's not the first time that Clyde Barker and, and Chris Angel have worked together. Back in the nineties. Clyde Barker actually did some spoken word stuff as an introduction for uh, a Chris Angel music album, uh, which at the time it was not a Chris Angel solo career thing. It was like he was in a band, and uh, it was called Stardust, I think. Mm-hmm. I forgot. I forgot the name of that. But I, I told you about it, Ryan, a while ago, right? Yeah. Uh, no, and I remember when that yeah, happened. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it, it was cool. It was cool, but at the same time, it was a little disappointing. I not it it doesn't reflect on Clive or Lord of Illusions at all. It reflects more on Chris Angel from my part, <laughs> yeah. my disappointment, and uh, you know. So that that was my that was my feedback on this. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, Midnight Meat Train was an, announced as to get a a, a standalone uh, edition by Dark Regions Press. Mm, cool. And uh, that one, I think it sold out really fast. I mean, I think the first day they had, they sent out another announcement saying, "Oh, it's already fifty percent sold out." So it's a very limited edition. It has a lot of cool artwork in it. I can't even remember if I ordered it or not now. And uh, I think it's bound in alligator skin. Uh, one of yeah, one of the editions is one of them. Yeah, oh. one of the more expensive ones. Really, that's that's weird considering Clive's stance on animals and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's kind of weird. But sure, <laughs> yeah, it should have been bound human skin. Yeah, <laughs> people could well, donate themselves. Like this is what I want. Yeah. This is what I want my. This is what I want you to do with my remains. Yeah, people people riding on a subway will will find themselves bound into a book. I want you to take that pinhead tattoo out of my back and bind it in a book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in October of 2013, Clyde Barker was, among other things, uh, uh, made a special uh, appearance in a Halloween ball in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, Miss Kitty, I think. Yeah, which is kind of a big deal because he hasn't been, um, you know, since he, since he's been recovering, he hasn't made a whole lot of public appearances. No, uh, but this would this would be his second time in a row doing that. Yeah, and I think he said at one point that this would be like his fourth time actually going out of the house to go wow. somewhere since his coma. That so... makes sense because during the the Egyptian theater cabal cut, he said he'd only been out just a handful of times in the last two years. Right. Seven yeah. times, I think it was seven times when he said. Yeah, that. and he was he was pretty. That was fairly soon after that that Egyptian theater uh, screening. That was fairly soon after his his uh, after his his uh, medical thing. So the coma. So he was he was pretty weak during that. I think he was leaning on Mark and. Wait, you're talking about the Egyptian theater cabal cut screening? Yeah, or, or that, am I I'm no, confusing that, was, that with the, the first L.A. screening? No, his his uh, coma was in 2012, January, right? 
Yeah, January yeah. 2012. Yeah, you're, yeah the, the Egyptian screening was last year, this, this last year. So, no, that was already, like, that was already way after that. Oh, yeah, yeah, because the, even the very first, no, the, the, second screen, the second screening that I went to in New Jersey, that one was, um, Clive Barker was going to come and he canceled. And mm-hmm. he canceled a few other places as well, I think. Like, con- there was a thing in Kentucky that he canceled. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, oh, yeah, yeah. That was, that was like, a few months ago, uh, in October or something, 2013. Um, the, oh, yeah. the, the, the Egyptian was a few months ago? In November, I think, right? Yeah, the Egyptian was um, okay. October. 20th. Yeah, okay. Then I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of the very, the, um... There was a screening. It was only the very, I think, the second screening, ever. <laughs> like, uh, and that was in L.A. Um, in what's the name of that theater? That's that's um, the Beverly. Yeah, the Beverly, the New Beverly. That's the one I was thinking of. Oh, okay. That one. That one was like, not, not super long after his coma. Uh, that was maybe like a year after yeah, his yeah. coma. I think sometime around that. Anyway, so um, yeah, that was October. Uh, there were the skull medallions that came out in the Clyde Barker store. Mm-hmm. Those those skull medallions made out of a, a drawing from Clyde Barker. Yeah. Um, he also was contacted by uh, Harvey Weinstein, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. At this point, where they were like, well, we, you know. Mark Miller told us that Harvey Weinstein contacted Clive and said, well, this is your world. Please explain it to me because, you know, they want to do a Hellraiser remake. Yeah. So, uh, again, you know, Clive Barker is going to be involved in a project with the Weinsteins to possibly rewrite Hellraiser and make a Hellraiser remake, which – this kind of happened like a few years ago, and, well, and, and what, what we know is that the talks went well, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to do the right thing or that they're going to hire Clive Barker. Right. It just means to me that the Weinstein's are still they they still haven't given up on the idea of remaking Hell Hellraiser and try to you know. Well, and, and he told them that that it you know that he should write it and that Doug Bradley should be the only person that plays Pinhead. Yeah. Um, and they agreed with that, but that doesn't. I mean, they they also probably knew that some of the movies they were making were terrible, and they did them anyway. Mm-hmm. So it's like agreeing that something should be done a certain way to be good doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to do something that's good. No. No. No, because then, you know, the bottom line gets in the way, and it's like, yeah. well, how much money can we make out of this movie, and how you little money... You can make it PG-13, because you want the young kids to come see it. Oh, exactly. Oh. Well, I think at the time of the remake, and at the time, you know, that the the remake, back in 2009 or eight, I don't even know, yeah. but I remember when the, the, the Clyde Barker said he was writing a treatment for a remake of the Hellraiser movie and that they were going to uh, it was going to be done by the wine scenes and all that stuff and they were looking at uh, teams of writers directors to work on it and uh, we had people from like France uh, uh, Patrick Lucier was going to be involved mm-hmm. uh, then there was going to be people like uh, Todd Farmer who wrote Drive Angry 3D and uh, there were people involved who had worked on uh, Feast 2 and 3, I think, at one point. And I don't even know. There were so many names being thrown out. Yeah. Oh, these guys have been probed by the Weinsteins. These guys have been hired by the Weinsteins. These guys are going to be writing like a draft for the Weinsteins Hellraiser remake. And then invariably what happened was uh, – when you really started to think, so what's going on with this? Then another piece of news would come out and say, no, actually, they decided to go with someone else because this guy is now going to do a movie and that guy is going to write that movie. And, and it's like, okay, so what happened was time just kept on ticking. And it came to the point where the Weinsteins had to make another Hellraiser movie 
due to contractual yeah. obligations. Otherwise, the property of Hellraiser, which they took out with Miramax when they created the Weinstein Company, would just revert back to the mother company that they, you know, came out of, which yeah. is owned by Disney, I think. So, <laughs> so Gary Tunnicliffe adapted one of his uh, adapted his remake script and yeah. turned it into Hellraiser Revelations. Right. So he he made Hellraiser Revelations in like two months or something like that. It was a yeah. ridiculous amount of time. I think from the time when they said let's make a movie until it came out, it was like four months or something like that. And that Which, I mean that was it's that movie is sickening and it was a nail in the coffin. I mean it was a final nail in the coffin of Hellraiser. Yeah, and it's Hell. weird that there are people who defend that movie like really, really actively. There are people who say, Well, yeah. that's still a really good movie, all the elements are there and there's a twist and there's this and that and I'm like yeah, but it's the way it's made. It's so cheaply made that it, it you don't really. The story is not. It's it it's all mediocre. It's nothing the, the, in there the is acting impressive. Is horrible. The twist is stupid, and yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of elements that are lifted directly from the original Hellraiser because it was uh, it was it had elements of a remake in it. Yeah, it was just quick and easy to reference. It was just quick yeah. and easy references to the original movie. I'm not sure about that uh, remake thing that you're talking about. I'm not sure that that was a remake script. I read that from uh, an interview with with um, Tony Gary. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I did not he, know that. He, he said that there were that that it, there were elements of of a remake oh. script. Oh, well, then he put in there. You can so see... he, he he might have rewritten it from scratch, but put stuff in from his remake script. Wow. So that tells us that at one point that was. Uh, he thought that was good enough to be a Hellraiser reboot or remake script to yeah. begin with. That would have been a terrible remake. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's 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 really kind of Stephanie. Did you see Hellraiser Revelations? Um, I I don't think I can bring myself to watch it. <laughs> good girl. <laughs> yeah. Good girl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, all it does is make you angry when you watch it. Like Ryan was punching the chair while he was watching the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it dulls after the first time. You know, watching it the second time, I I was able to sit through it without getting angry. Uh, but the first time, it's it just is such an offense. You know, I don't it's, know. I I, I don't. Th I'm very vocal about all this stuff. There was that, there was that uh, Hellraiser uh, pitch trailer that came out. Hellraiser Origins. Right. And you know, I I I, I try to stay away from this, and I try to be like, okay, I'm just gonna gonna. Uh, but it's like I don't want Hellraiser remade. I don't want it remade. Yeah. You know, if you're gonna do anything with Hellraiser, just Jesus, just do like a, a good a good movie. But you don't have to negate all the stuff that came before, especially Hellraiser one and two. You don't have to say that. Well, we're just gonna remake it for a new audience, and you know, with better special effects. And it's like it's not about that. It's not about that. That's not what made it great. It was the story. It was the characters. It was the Cenobites. And you can't – lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. You know, and I don't believe that any remake adds anything good to any franchise. Well, in Hellraiser Origins, I mean, he, Paul Gerard said that he was in talk with the Weinsteins. So in in a way, I mean, they, those might be – Clive Barker's project and, and that project might be competing – uh, competing story, yeah, you know, yeah. competing remake. Yeah, idea. so if they I could at least make it take place in a different period of time, maybe they would bring something different to the table. Yeah, but, I mean, different uh, Cenobites too. I mean, the, what's wrong with that? Yeah, well, I mean, the the only thing they did at one point they tried to do that with Hellraiser four, except of course it went sour because there wasn't enough money, and then they started like interfering, and then you know. It just became like a big mess production, you know. Yeah. It became an Alan Smithy movie, but that was well, that, that that killed the theatrical movies, and that's what put them to direct to video and made them start being, yeah. you know, really terrible. That was sad. That was a sad time. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, November 2013 sees the first publication of The Candle in the Cloud, along with The yes. Wood on the Hill. Uh, Clive which, Barker's first tales. Clive Barker's first tales, exactly. He wrote it while he was like uh, 12 17? and 17 or something like that, yeah. Yeah. Candle in the Cloud was like when he was a preteen. 
and then and then uh, the wood. What or the no? It's oh, the, the wood, other, on, the the wood hill. on the hill is when he was a preteen, and then Candle in the Cloud is when, when he was older. It's a little more ambitious. It's a, a bigger yeah. story. It's like a little novel. So yeah, and the Wood yeah. on the Hill was previously released, but Candle in the Cloud has never been published. Um, we've just seen excerpts of it in Phil and Sarah's book. And if you go to realclybarker dot com, that's Clyde Barker's store online, you can download the audio book for this book. And but I also there are ebooks available to buy now too on like Amazon and iBooks. Right, but uh, I strongly advise you also to buy the book. And, yeah. you know, there's all sorts of uh, you know there's all sorts of editions going from the standard one to the spiffy numbered lettered whatever it is that costs hundreds of dollars. But uh, you know. Listen to the audiobook and and go for it because it's going to run out really quickly. Have you listened to the audiobook yet? Yeah, I've I li- listened to. Oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I've listened to uh, Wood on the Hill. Oh, okay. The free download. Yeah. So the the free one only had Wood on the Hill. It didn't have. No, it has it has Candle in the Clouds. Too. Oh, okay. Yeah, you haven't heard the audiobook yet, Ryan. N- no, I want to read it first. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah, me too. I have them saved on the desktop, but I haven't done anything with them. Sure, sure. Uh, so, also, there were uh, Damnation Game Limited Editions announced for 2014 from Cemetery yeah. Dance. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, which, you know, that's, that's cool. So, In the Hills, the Cities is going to pop up in Horror Express Anthology. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that that's pretty much it. December, we have the uh, Books of Blood. Audio version of Audible. Yeah, and and, and then just this month they 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 finally finished or they finally put in number six. So, so the books of blood are complete. Yeah, yeah. So that that was cool. That was that yeah. was that was the, the the whole 2013 year in review here. Yeah. So what is what are your personal highlights? Oh, uh, the release of the Cabal Cuts, uh, the, the announcement. announcement. Yeah. yeah. That was a very emotional day for me because I, I, you know, I was I was like hoping for it to happen, and I I thought at one point this might take a few years, you know. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if this is going to come out like when we wanted to, and mm-hmm. then when the the announcement came out, I was I was just like jumping up and down, I was running around, I was like posting yeah. everywhere like. Cabal cut is coming. The cabal cut is coming. So uh, that that was pretty emotional for me. Yeah, yeah. Stephanie, what about you? What was your personal highlight? Cabal cut. Um, yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I was. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't on the ride from the very beginning, but I got the end of it, and there were results. And well, I like and it the, depends uh, on what you think of as the beginning, right? Too, because a lot of people knew about the that there was supposed to be an extended version of it since the nineties. So, yeah, I'd always yeah. heard that there was this um, missing footage, but I was not aware that there was yeah. a brigade out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was, I mean, that was that was just pretty fortuitous. I mean, and the Scarlet Gospels would be my other oh most my favorite. Yeah, yeah, definitely. When when you know, finally he said the Scarlet Gospels are finished. I was like, oh my god, I can't believe it. Yeah. I've been waiting for this for like fourteen years. It's like, yeah, like 12 or 14 years. I mean. Well, and it started out as a short story, too. And Clive started out, you know, announcing it as a spoiler. Like, oh, yeah, I'm doing a story where, uh, you know, uh, Pinhead dies and it's got Ari the Moor. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're you're giving yeah, away the thing. But yeah, then, he's like, sorry to Doug Bradley, but I'm killing off Pinhead. Yeah, and I was like, oh, man, he just, like, said a major spoiler, and now everybody knows that. But it might have changed. I mean, it, it, it's probably changed quite a bit from his original idea as a short sure. story. Yeah, I mean, I, just I, look I, at what they've been doing with the comic books. It's like yeah. Pinhead has become kind of like anybody can be Pinhead, you know, as long as they just stick the pins and put the, the garb on, they become Pinhead in hell. Well, and I think his original thinking was that, you know, he was tired of the – of of other people messing up the Hellraiser universe, and he wanted to kind of put his own, you know, put his own pin in it. I guess you could say, you know, <laughs> say like, 
okay, this is you know this is this is the Clive Barker version of what happens in Hellraiser, and this is the end, and I'm killing Pinhead because I'm so sick of these of all these uh, sequel you know all these sequels. Yeah, but then Harvey but Weinstein it, showed up and was like, "Hey, we want you to remake Hellraiser." Right, uh, right. But but I think my but my point is I think that the story took on a life of its own and it went from a short story to a novella to a novel yeah. and it and it separated itself out from the collection of short stories and became its own thing and it's probably the story's evolved. Yeah. Uh so that that you know that was the other moment that Stephanie yeah. said is when they said the Scarlet Cosples are finished. What about your moments, Ryan? Um yeah, I mean those two for sure definitely I mean, we we've been working so hard on Occupy Midian, and uh, just to hear that that they that there's actually going to be a release was huge. Um, so yeah, that and and uh, and of course the Scarlet Gospels. But then again, it's October. It's like winter 2015 is when it's going to come out. So I'm trying not to get super excited because it's a long wait still. Um, uh, I think Clive Barker's first tales. You know, oh, really? for, yeah, for me, I just I love collecting, you know, these rare stories and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I think and, and you know, and Dolly, too. I mean, and, and that's not a super exciting. I mean, I know that's not like a super like mega release or anything, but I'm I'm really excited about that, too. That, that too, definitely. I mean, I was uh, very excited as well because of Candle in the Cloud. I <laughs> I had already read. Uh, the Wood on the Hell years ago right. when I when I read the Douglas E. Winter's uh, authorized biography of Clive and, Barker and, and we read it again for the for the um, one of rare our episodes. stories yeah. yeah the rare stories episode so uh, yeah I I I understood it was going to be around the same kind of like style that had Wood on the Hill Maximilian Bacchus so Candle in the Cloud I'm still waiting also to buy the book before I hear the audiobook. Because it's a longer story, and like I said, I have issues with audiobooks. Like, I want to read the, the words on the page, yeah. and I, I space off really quickly. I drift off when I'm listening to an audiobook, and sometimes I... Like, kind, I kind of yeah. feel like listening to the audiobook right now would spoil it, and which <laughs> is a weird, it's a weird thing to think, but... I think it would have been nice if um, the... Um, if one of those stories was narrated by an actual 13-year-old instead of a <laughs> grown man. Be- that would be cool. Like a British yeah. young boy. <laughs> that is a good idea. That would be a kind of immersive experience. Like, hey, Clive Barker wrote this story, and then a little British boy would start reading the story. That <laughs> make you yeah. think of little Clive with like his little round glasses and his little bangs. Yeah, telling like campfire stories to people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess there was one other one other news thing, or I mean, one other thing. Um, Leviathan, the story of Hellraiser and Hell, Hellbound Hellraiser two. So mm. this is like an upcoming documentary. Um, I, it's not it's, official, right? It's more I mean, of a fan thing, right? It's a, it's yeah. more of a fan thing being done by British people in England. Yeah, and they've yeah. been they've been uh, contacting all these people who were involved in the movies. They've they've talked to like Oliver Parker. Jack Bradley, Oliver Smith, the guy who played Frank the Monster. Yeah, and Nicholas Vince and, and Simon Bamford. Yeah, and even like, you know, people who were involved in the technical aspect, not not just actors as well. And Barbie Wilde too, I think. Yeah. Yeah, with the, the little teaser video from Simon. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that, I mean, that's cool. I, I It's not an official thing, and um, we'll see what happens with it. We don't know uh, we don't know when production's starting. I mean, I guess they've already done some interviews. Uh, we don't know when it's going to come out. Is it going to be crowdfunded? Is it, it? Does it have like official backing? I mean, not I official know. like Clive Barker, but official like you know from a movie studio kind of a thing. I guess we'll wait and see. I mean, yeah. they seem to be doing a pretty thorough work, so uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. And it's just another testament that Hellraiser still lives. Mm-hmm. As it should. Yeah. It's yeah. an awesome movie. Yeah, yeah, and, and Hellraiser too. 
that doesn't need to be remade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, okay. I, I really like more than a movie like an experience. Yeah, yeah and, and and some people would say, and I don't know how I feel about this, but some people would say that whatever they do, it can't be as bad as Hellraiser Revelations or Hellraiser Eight. What what was that? Uh, Hell World. I mean, but that's setting the bar really low, isn't it? That's which like, one was Hell World? Was that the one with? Um... Lance. Yes. Uh, Hell World. Yeah, that was. Yeah, in a in a house with a party. Yeah. Uh, and a spinning giant. I, I, for me, the worst one must have been the one with. Um, oh yeah, the the one where they they brought back um, Christy Cotton. Oh. Uh, wow. is, uh, it just I. Hellseeker. 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 I just don't see her making that kind of deal. Yeah. With Pinhead. No, she was. I mean, yeah, the, the, she was written like she was a completely different person, wasn't she? And yes, uh, kind of. I mean, the, the the original script, she was not Christy Cotton, but she was called Christy. And it's a really weird one. I I have a copy. I have a draft, or a, a original, one of the few first drafts for Hellseeker. And it's a really weird draft, man. I mean, like, Trevor and Christy are in a car, and she's about to give birth, and he's driving to the hospital, and she's, like, doing math square roots mentally in her head uh, between contractions and all of a sudden she just like undoes his buckle and goes for it while they're driving to the hospital and I have no idea why that would happen in a movie it's like I think it's from uh, uh, what's the name of the guy Dupre the guy who wrote the script oh. it's just terrible it's terrible it's a terrible script and then they rewrote it and they turned it into uh, a scene where she's driving with him in the car but what she does is she shoots his head off, and they fall in a river, which makes a lot more sense to me. Yeah, it's just it's just weird. You so can this, find... the, at least this is this one is a, one of those rare scripts that started out as a Hellraiser movie, right? It wasn't something else that was adapted. Right. I think this one they actually wrote it as a weird kind of Hellraiser movie. Yeah, I, I, I mean, which in a way is makes it one of the saddest ones at all at, of all because that's what they come up with yeah Kirsty gets married to mayhem so <laughs> mayhem <laughs> yeah i was hoping yeah. to see the guy like throw himself yeah. down a flight of stairs or something yeah. and there's the the cop bad cop good cop oh. bad cop with the yes. head that comes out from behind i was like oh. i don't know there's parts of this movie that i actually enjoy that, that they're funny Mm -hmm. And but the one that I really really hated was uh, Deader. I, I thought Deader was terrible. I have the first draft that mm -hmm. had absolutely nothing to do with Hellraiser of the script, yeah. and I read it, and it was like it was an average horror movie. Yeah, it's cool. You know, it has a completely different ending and stuff. But we, I get that feeling watching it. They just threw Pinhead in there. Yeah, yeah, they just threw him in there. It's like it was about this 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 uh, reporter who would find this group of people called the Deaders, and basically the guy would bring them back from the dead. But then, after a while, they would want to die for real, and they couldn't because you know. So the the thing was, uh, Marlowe was trying to contact the uh, reporter to to help them you know find peace or something and then there's this weird scene where she crosses a dimension and she goes into a place where everything is white and there's a guy who sticks her with a knife and they just kind of rewrote those sections and put pinhead in there and uh, at the end of the movie she would appear uh in her editor's office instead of dying in an explosion where the, the Cenobites all blow up in Romania, she would actually show up in her uh, editor's office with big sunglasses. And then he'd be like, oh, hey, it's nice to see you again. And she would take off the glasses and she would have no eyes. And she would just start re repeating the word, my lips aren't real, my flesh isn't real, my muscles aren't real, which is something they say in the movie, the debtors. That's one of the ritual things they say. So that would be the ending of the movie. Uh, when Pinhead was not a part of it at all. So, yeah, uh, yeah I, you know, that's... Inferno is also another stinker for me. I'll raise her five. Yeah. Yeah, well, and a lot of people, uh, a lot of people are really, will really violently defend Hellraiser five. Yeah. I don't know. Not, not me. I, the director not actually... Not me. Said, yeah. <laughs> The director, Scott Derrickson, actually said uh, in an interview that I just try to do a 
tabula rasa out of everything that came before, and I just created my own thing for this Hellraiser. And I didn't even watch. I didn't even know what the mythos was or whatever. So yeah. it's the like, hint of Jacob's ladder. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, it's more than a hint. It's more yeah, than actually, a hint. A lot of them. A lot of those sequels rip off Jacob's ladder. Yeah, like, especially Hellseeker Deader. Did. Yeah, Deader and Hellseeker and uh, and Five Inferno. Yeah, they, they're all those sequences where is this a dream or is this real? Oh, he's gonna die. Oh no, he woke up. Oh, what's yeah. going on here? Oh, there's Pinhead at yeah. the corner of the room, saying yeah. something. And people and then, not realizing they're in hell. Yeah, and then at the end, it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, welcome to hell. And then it's like, ugh, all right. Yeah. You, know, you can just you can just start thinking about what kind of movies out there could you just add Pinhead at the at the end. <laughs> And yeah. say like "Welcome to Hell." Uh, yeah, think about Matrix or something. Welcome to Hell, Care Bears. Yeah. Oh my God, Care Bears! I like this reference in um, Cabin in the Woods. Oh yeah, yeah. There, there's right. an actual uh, Cenobite in that movie. Yeah. Listed uh, in the credits as Fornicus, Lord of Bondage and Pain. And yeah. he he had a little music box. So yeah, that was a pretty crazy movie. Yeah crazy but um so yeah i mean do we have any uh yes listener yeah 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 um so from uh so i asked the question what were your personal highlights from 2013 either releasements or announcements uh bradley gartz says cabal cut and the scarlet gospel announcements i've also enjoyed the fiddle black release of cabal actually we didn't mention that i mean that was a big deal um, that was a really nice addition, uh, and that did you know, and that came out 2013. I'm sorry, what? The Fiddle Black edition release of Cabal. Well, we we mentioned that, right? Yeah, no, we did. I was just saying in our personal highlights, I'd I'd kind of go back and you know add that in. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was okay. It, it was nice. I mean, I had just read cabal again for the episode where we discussed cabal so when the book came out it was it was more like reading just the little bits that were before cabal and after cabal well it's a it's a nice addition to put on your shelf it is yeah um mary bastion said cabal cut will be released on dvd so that's you know um a lot of people are going to be saying that craig reese said highlights of 2013 were the cabal cut and occupy midian success foremost (laughs) Uh, the kind of the kind of official confirmation of the upcoming TV and movie projects. Well, yeah, she's talking about Nightbreed. We'll see. Um, and Clive continues recovery from Clive's continued recovery from his health issues. Looking forward to a Barker filled 2014. I think we're going to have a lot more new things to talk about in 2014. Yeah, yeah. One of the things we forgot to mention was that uh, Tom Requiem. Uh, story that's going to be reprinted and that was reprinted in an anthology tom requiem right. was one of the members of the infernal parade right yeah 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 so it, that, for me that kind of gets me hoping that they're going to follow up uh with an infernal parade book mm. you know and, and do all of them instead of just that tom requiem that's why i didn't buy that book that they right um but i don't know i don't have any insider knowledge on that i w- i kind of hope that's what they do sure um, let's see. Paul Fluitt says Cabal Cut release and news and seeing the movie with a bunch of new friends was awesome. Hearing about projects in the coming year or so, Scarlet Gospels news is so exciting. And Oliver Oliver Parker Sleep Thief of Always movie news. Yeah, yeah, totally. Those are those are great. Um Steve Dillon says Cabal Cut and Clive's continued recovery, of course. And yeah. Dave, David Anderson says Mine are pretty standard, I suppose. The 2015 release date for Scarlet Gospels was number one on the list. Director's cut of Nightbreed on Blu-ray was up there, too, but I was pretty sure that was going to happen eventually. Um, Yeah, yeah. And then um, uh, on Twitter, Andrew Hawkins says, The Aberat 3 art has been amazing. So if you follow Clive on Facebook and Twitter, he's been... The Facebook posts with Aberat 3 art have been going into Twitter, and I guess that's what he's talking about. Um, and Facebook. And Facebook, yeah. Um, I, I, 
I mean, that's that's great and everything, but if you have Aberat three, that's all in there. Sure, and it, you know, I mean, there's a lot more of it. You know, you're not going to be seeing, you're just seeing like a handful of uh, yeah. paintings on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Get get the book. Get the book. The book has got like hundreds of of paintings in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I see those as like, oh yeah, that's a cool one. Mm-hmm. You probably saw there's some a, of those. There's a painting though that I I saw that it has two different names. Oh really? Really, it's the one where um, it's in one of the Aberat books. It's um. It kind of looks like the profile of uh, uh, this boy, and he has really round ears and a really straight back, and he's kind of uh, smiling. Is that the oh. Comexo kid? Um, no. That's Does something he... he re- uh, it was released on Facebook, and it's okay. at the Century Guild Oh, okay, gallery. so that's not an Aberat painting. Is it I on a white sworn... background? On a white background, I could have sworn it's an Ari's it's an Aberat painting. Ari's eyes look like buttons or something. Yeah, it's a. Uh, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. I know which yeah, one you mean. Yeah. Forty-eight by sixty inches. Uh-huh. He calls it dissension at Century Guild, but it used to be called Nat Check. Oh hmm. yeah, I remember that. Uh, you know, I would say that probably Clyde Barker keeps things in flux, so that is probably something that I, I remember at one point. There's a really early picture of him with one of the uh, characters, which later became uh, an Aberat character. And at the time, I, I, I don't think that it had a real name. But then when he started making more paintings, then I think that may have been when he started actually naming them and creating them as characters for the story. Mm. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, he changes the names of the paintings on occasion. As, yeah. as he, like, looks at them and, like, oh, this is going to be a character. I'm going to put him in. It's going to call him, like, something. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure he keeps those things in flux. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, that that was it. I think we've hit the end of our the end of our uh, of our feedback and, and of our episode. All right. It was it was a great year. It was a really exciting year. And a lot of stuff happened. We had our highlights. And 2014 is going to be even better because there's more stuff coming out. There's going to be the, you know, books, stories, uh, unpublished material is going to be coming out. So There's even movies that they're working on that are top secret right now. Yeah, yeah, that we can't talk about. But uh, let's, let's hope that uh, 2014 is going to be a really cool year for all Clyde Barker fans out there. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for listening to episode... 62 of the Clive Barker podcast. Um, special thanks to Jose. Uh, bandwidth for this episode was provided by Jose. He has provided a lot of financial support in addition to being, uh, you know, being one of the, the hosts, you know, along with me on, on there. So um, appreciate that. And uh, thanks again, Jose. And uh, a special thanks to our guest host, uh, Stephanie Iribaran. So thanks for joining us. That was a lot of fun. Um, we kept it under two hours somehow, and which was awesome. You can find us on the web at www.clivebarkercast.com. Uh, we're on iTunes. Leave us a review. We're on Podomatic, Xbox Music Store, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, Double Twist, BlackBerry, and Pocket Cast. Uh, we're, we have a Facebook page, so come like the Facebook page. Join the Occupy Midian group. On Twitter, we're at BarkerCast and at Occupy Midian. And the forum is www.clivebarkerfans.com slash forum, theme by Colin Lakativa. Uh, 